So welcome everybody uh, to today's Short Center Compassion in Action webinar, Portraits of Compassion, a conversation with the 2023 National Compassionate Caregivers of the Year. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Collier, Senior Director of Programs here at the Schwartz Center. As many of you know, we are a Boston-based nonprofit organization established in 1995 to advance compassion in healthcare. Our vision at the Schwartz Center is that everyone who provides and receives healthcare experiences compassion. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about what you can expect. Please note that the program will last 60 minutes with a panel discussion for the first 40 minutes or so, followed by some time for questions. Feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A pane throughout the discussion. I'd also like to acknowledge with gratitude that this Compassion in Action webinar series has been funded in part by a generous donation made in memory of Juli Julian and Eunice Cohen. With that, I'll hand it over to Mark Reynolds, Short Center Board Chair and President at CRICO, to share about the history of the National Compassionate Caregivers of the Year Award. On behalf of everyone at CRICO, we're honored to support the National Compassionate Caregivers of the Year Award. Through our support for this award, CRICO joins the Schwartz Center in advancing compassionate care and promoting safety. Research shows that the direct a direct correlation between compassion and reduced medical errors. And no one exemplifies compassion more than this year's six recipients. The 2023 honorees represent a wide range of backgrounds and experiences from operating rooms to homeless outreach programs, from hospices to prison clinics and beyond. But they're united by their extraordinary compassion toward their patients and colleagues. Today, we'll hear personal stories from the six recipients about their experiences of providing compassionate care. Thank you for joining us to celebrate these remarkable caregivers. I'll hand it off to Dr. Beth Lown, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief Medical Officer of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. I know she's excited to get this conversation started. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. And thanks to everybody for joining us. We're very happy that you are with us today. I'm going to introduce our panelists. And um, I'm going to begin with Christy Capps, who is Community Nurse Case Manager for Population Health, Providence St. Mary Medical Center in Washington. Welcome, Christy. Laura Harmon. Uh, who is chair of the Department of Surgery at Boulder Community Health, Colorado. Hi, Dr. Harmon. Uh, Catherine Kirkland, section chief and director of palliative medicine, Dartmouth Health in New Hampshire. Hi, Dr. Kirkland. Sumi Mwa, uh, who is senior hospice aide, Care Dimensions Hospice in Massachusetts. Hi, Sumi. Uh, Dr. Sonny Sutherland, <laughs> um, medical director, detention health, Contra Costa Health, California. And finally, Lisa Thornsberry on behalf of the Complex Discharge Team, UK Healthcare, Good Samaritan Hospital in Kentucky. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to everybody who is listening. We're really, really happy to be able to share these wonderful people with all of you. And so I'm gonna ask each of you just to tell us a little bit about your background, uh, and your work, uh, you know, what drew you to healthcare? So I'm just going to go around what I can see. I'll start again with Christy. Would you like to say a little bit about your background, who you are, what drew you to healthcare? And uh, your work, I'm, of course. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, my name is Christy Caps. I am the community nurse case manager in population health here at Providence St. Mary's in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, I started in healthcare well many years ago. I first started with a degree in anthropology and women's studies, uh, which led me to Zambia and West Africa and for part of the summer where I was working alongside nurses and other uh, healthcare related uh, people. And I was providing education and women's services and realized I wanted to be a nurse because I saw all these things that a nurse got to do. So um, fast forward. A long time. I went to nursing school. Um, I've had experience in vascular surgery, dermatology, family medicine, women's health, 
pretty much a GI, like lots of different um, experiences in nursing, but it led me to population health about uh, going on five years ago um, because I always wanted to be able to um, help in every way I could. And I felt like this was the best fit because I get to work uh, connecting people to access and resources now and the community, and that's mostly with homeless, substance abuse, and mentally ill individuals now. And I absolutely love the work and feel very honored to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, Laura, would you like to unmute and say a little bit about yourself and the work that you do and why you do it, what you love about it? Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Laura Harmon. I'm at Boulder Community Health. Um, I've been here about three years before that. Um, I was solidly an academic surgeon um, and uh, did my training in uh, trauma acute care and surgical critical care. Um, three years ago, I um, was just kind of in the middle of COVID and doing a lot of um, COVID ICU and got really burned out um, and realized that uh, if I did not make a change in my practice and, and in my professional life, that I would not be a doctor for very long. Um, so a position came open at Boulder Community Health and it was an opportunity to really kind of get back to my roots of medicine, which was community health and uh, patient uh, forward interactions. Um, and so I took the job here as the trauma medical director and uh, the first traumatologist in the community. Um, and so it's been a really fun experience to bring academic surgery to the community uh, and then also get to do it uh, just with love and, and kindness. Mm -hmm. As, and so we know from everything everybody else has <laughs> submitted about you and said. So thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Kathy, can you unmute and, and join us? Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I feel like I've also been in medicine for a million years, like Christy said. I um, have always been drawn to the power of people's stories. And maybe as an English major, that's what launched me in that direction. And I started in infectious disease, but about uh, 12 years ago, I really felt the call to move into palliative care where I think it was to really work in that space where people are facing serious, life-limiting illnesses and they're trying to make decisions that are really hard where there's no, there's no sort of pathway that seems like that's what I really want. And so having to adjust to um, choices that aren't always the best. And I felt like it was a place where the power of listening to somebody's story to learn how I could help them on that decision-making journey and then through the consequences of whatever decision they made is really what drew me into um, palliative care, and I feel every day, every patient I encounter is a unique manifestation of that um, that serious illness situation. And so I just love being able to bring myself to the story they have to tell and trying to figure out how to contribute when I hear it. Mm, thanks, Kathy. And listening is so key uh, and so critical. Um, Sumi, are you ready? Can you unmute? There you go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Tell us um, about you. Go ahead. My name is Sumi Mwai. Um, I am a certified hospice and palliative nursing aide and a senior hospice aide for Care Dimensions Hospice in Danvers. Um, I have taken care of hundreds of patients in different settings, um, like at the Care Dimensions Kaplan Hospice House, um, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, group homes, but I mainly take care of patients in their homes, in their home settings. Um, I'm also a preceptor and I train new higher aids uh, for care dimensions out in the field and uh, mentor and train and prepare them um, 
for work in the hospice field. And uh, I have taken care of patients of all ages, all genders, uh, different, different ethnicities and cultures, um, valid status in society. And um, I love my job. <laughs> I love my job with a lot of passion. Um, it has taught me to be humane. It has taught me uh, to appreciate the small things that we take for granted in life. It has taught me the true meaning of compassionate and humanity. Thank you. Ah, thanks, Sumi. That's lovely. Um, I love your background. It looks like light is beaming out, out of your head. <laughs> it's a great, great metaphor. Um, Sonia. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm just thrilled to be here and honored to be among such compassionate people. Um, it really propels me to be more compassionate. <laughs> I am an internal medicine physician. Lisa, you're on. <laughs> oh, hello. So my name is Lisa Thornsberry, and I'm sorry that I missed the awards banquet. Um, I um, I hear it was tremendous, and, uh, and I know our group uh, was beyond proud to be there and to be accepted. Um, my background is, is I'm a registered nurse. I finished my doctorate degree about five years ago in nursing. I've been a nurse for about 33 years, and 20 to 25 years of those have been in leadership. Um, and my background has primarily been in hospital medicine. Um, that is my calling. I absolutely love hospital medicine. And I think the reason I do is you see all aspects of care. Um, my big focus over the years has been in discharge planning. Um, and at our facility, one of the things that I led was something called Project Boost. Uh, which was a process to work on our discharge planning. We noticed very early on uh, at UK Healthcare that um, we needed a specific unit, um, which our group uh, designed and led for our complex patients and discharge. Honestly, um, I've always wanted to be in healthcare. Um, every day to me is a blessing when I get to go to work and I can make a difference in people's lives. And one of the things I've learned through leadership is I may not be at the bedside every day now, but then I can make a difference in my leaders and I can give them my experiences and share those with them. Um, so as they take the lead, um, they can better allow access to care for our patients because our vulnerable population is growing more every single day with our adults. Um, I think for most of us, it is a calling and it's not a job. And I want that to continue as I continue my journey in nursing. And I can't imagine doing anything else because it's extreme, extremely rewarding to me. Mm, thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. I'm hoping that we can get uh, Sonia back. I know it's sometimes hard for her to connect from where she is located. Um, but let's keep going. And I, I am going to ask um, just a few of you uh, about this question. We know that meaningful recognition is really important, especially for those who are just always, you know, working in direct patient care. Um, but it's not often extended, you know, um, to those who are really on the front lines. And so we'd love to hear a little bit about you know, what is the impact of receiving this award on you, your team, and your organization? And I wonder if um, I can start out with you again, Christy. Hi again. Yeah, this award um, was, you know, as I keep telling everyone, a huge soul boost. Um, can you all hear me? I know my audio was a little... Um, so I, uh, we've experienced a lot of leadership changes in our department over the last year. Um, and as you know, uh, being able to really provide compassionate care, as Kenneth Schwartz said, starts at the top with the leadership. Um, so you really need, uh, you know, leadership. Do you feel that you are appreciated by, valued, so you can do that hard work out in the community? 
And I think with all the transitions this year up until Boston, I was feeling pretty uh, just tired <laughs> um, and and a, and a little bit discouraged by some uh, choices that, you know, directions of healthcare are going um, and just feeling a little bit lost, but still doing what I was doing. And um, I got to Boston and it was just this validation that uh, to stay on track to don't get too dismayed, uh, to pivot if you need to, if I needed to, um, for strong leadership. But I was with all these people that just uh, made uh, what we do um, feel as important as it is. And um, so to be with all these award, you know, winners and to know the compassion that they're, you know, striving to give every day and to be around that just it changed me again. It, it felt like I was uh, renewed and I wasn't, I wasn't discouraged. And now I have all these wonderful friends to connect to um, and, and leadership to, to lean on. So um, when I am feeling, you know, a little bit lost. So again, huge soul boost and lots of new friends. Mm, thanks, Christy. I'm so happy to hear it. it I really, it's, uh, well, you know, we know from all the studies that that this kind of meaningful recognition is so important to people. Um, you want to know that you're seen, you're valued, you belong, um, and you're appreciated, you know, for all the hard work that we do. Sonia, welcome back. I know, <laughs> I hope this, I'm sorry that <laughs> that happened so for you. It's yeah. <laughs> so it's a discombobulating. Right. Um, but, you know, I want to jump back to you and, and hear a little bit more about you, your background, your work, and, you know, what drew you into healthcare. Well, I'll try to say this very quickly. Um, I think I, always wanted to be a doctor. They tell me I said that when I went to kindergarten. I don't remember that, but um, certainly in middle school, I think I was just really fascinated by the human body and how, you know, God has engineered the whole body. Everything works together. We never think about breathing or thinking about making sure our heart can beat. And so that was just really interesting to me. And I loved math and science. And so I was able to uh, study medicine and become a doctor. And um, I have, uh, even starting back in high school, worked in one of the local county hospitals in Los Angeles. And so I've just really loved serving the population that has been underserved. And really my whole career has been in you know public health, if you will, and serving those who have been marginalized or disadvantaged. I did most of my clinical career as a hospitalist and teaching residents and medical students, and then got involved in quality and patient safety, loved that, and was able to um, do that. And that's how I first um, entered our jail system. So our healthcare system uh, for Contra Costa is an integrated, um, the health department is integrated healthcare services, which includes hospital, many different divisions, including detention health. And so I first went into the jail, you know, truthfully in response to a safety event that had occurred inside and in the work of patient safety. And then just started going in and out of the jail, um, and when COVID hit, I was asked to spend time to help build the COVID response. And then shortly after that, I was appointed the medical director. So it's been absolutely a fabulous um, and very rewarding um, part of my uh, healthcare career. Um, the people that work inside of jail are so committed. And I know it seems unusual. And unless you work in the jail, you don't really understand. I always like to tell people, there's a lot of compassion uh, behind the concrete walls, whether it's custody, um, the doctors, the nurses, the whole healthcare steam, team, and including the rest of the health department that we're integrated with. So it's really a priority for us. It's not a, last, a place of last resort for either the staff or the patients. We see it as a place of hope and restoration, rejuvenation. We feel on the healthcare side, our job is to take care of their health. We diagnose diseases, we're treating people. We want them to feel better, catch up with healthcare maintenance, all of those things, because we wanna give them a running start when they leave. We want mm -hmm. them to have their health under better control so then everything else can fall into place uh, when they leave our setting. 
And Amazing. it's, I mean, none of you have chosen particularly easy pathways. <laughs> Honestly, they're all so um, complex, rewarding, challenging at all at the same time. You know, this is, it's a, it's, it's really, uh, it's quite interesting um, what all of you are doing. And I think there are some who would say, how, why would you choose that? And, um, and, and, Each of you has found deep enrichment and personal meaning in what you're doing. Um, I wanted to get back to this notion about, you know, what's what has been the impact? I, you know, we're always interested in the personal impact, but we're really interested, too, on the impact on teams or on your organization of um, meaningful recognition and um, having won this award. So, Sonia, actually, why, why don't you pick that up since you were just speaking and, and see if you can talk about that a little bit. You know, what what was the impact of this award? Well, I think, you know, my immediate impact was really just feeling totally encouraged. And I just felt propelled. <laughs> I was thinking, I think that day when I found out, I feel like I said hello to more strangers. <laughs> and I felt like I was just... floating a little bit. Um, it's very encouraging. Uh, service is important, you know, the role that we play in serving others. And service is not always easy, right? It's hard work. You know, we love the work that we're providing in jail, but it, it can be very difficult at Mm times -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. So when someone recognizes uh, the work that's being done or says thank you, it's just extremely encouraging, not only to me personally, to our whole team, to really the health department. It just says that we're on the right track um, and the things that we love to do really does matter. Um, and I would also uh, just say I was thinking that um, I love sports, but when people go into sports, right, they go to win, right? You go to an event, there's a winner, there's a loser, you know, it's clear. When you're in healthcare, you go in there to provide for people, to serve people, but it's not there's a judgment every day. So when someone says you were compassionate, which is something that you love to do or a part of what goes on, it just is really uh, propels you to go to another level because it's unexpected. I think that's what I'm really trying to say, that it's unexpected. It's not the driver for what we do or why we do it, but an unexpected Thank you and an unexpected appreciation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah. And of course, then the question is, why is it unexpected? You know, why should we not all be valued and appreciated? You know, That's uh, not right. <laughs> uh, but It is how it is. Sumi, how about you? What was the impact of receiving this award on you and your team and so forth? You have to unmute. There you go. Okay. Um, <laughs> for me, it was unbelievable. It was shocking. Um, I didn't believe that I stood a chance amongst all those highly talented healthcare professionals in the healthcare um, world. And uh, noting that I'm just a CNA, And uh, this is a national wide award. I did not think that a person like me, I'm an immigrant, a black woman, minority. Um, even when I was nominated, um, <laughs> I submitted my application one day before the end. And uh, they had actually extended it, I think, one week because I had not submitted. And Angelina and Julie kept sending me emails, but I didn't believe in myself. Mm -hmm. And when it actually happened is when I, it, I really recognized, like, the kind of impact that the job that I do has on people. Because unfortunately, hospice, hospice care is always misunderstood. There are so many misconceptions and myths about hospice care. And um, 
when patients are admitted to hospice, there's always a lot of hostility, fear, anger, denial. So when, um, when a patient is admitted, I get to work with families and patients who are dealing with the five levels, five stages of grief and different levels of, of grief. And so sometimes it's very difficult to have a breakthrough, especially if there's a lot of anger and depression. But um, once you have a breakthrough and once you show compassion and love and care and empathy and treat the patient for who they are. I'm not there to treat the patient because, to take care of the patient because they're suffering from cancer or cardiac issues or whatever it is. No, I am there to take care of Mr. So-and-so for the person that they are. And so hospice is more about living their life to the fullest until they transition to end of life. And so we work with the patient and the family to get to meet their needs. So having had that kind of impact with patients and families, and that's not just discussing about death. I know that it's a hospice patient. And I know ultimately me or them or anybody else will die because death is inevitable. And having he to hear about cases that I have taken care of, people confessing about the impact that I made, the difference that I made, it really, it really it make, it gives me contention. So when I received this award, I was truly beyond humbled and honored because I did not believe that I was worth of it. Mm. Oh, so Meg, you, you know, it, your, um, your impact and your reward is in the love you give to the patients and they to you in return, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, that's just really palpable. You can, you can feel it while you're speaking, you can feel it in your essence. So thanks so much for, for responding to that. I um, wanted to just ask a few more questions. And, you know, one is really about, given all the circumstances and the challenges and, um, you know, the difficulties of healthcare, uh, as it, um, you know, it becomes more of a business, it's more commodified, it's less about people in the center, I think, in my opinion. Um, but what is it um, that enables compassion to thrive within you and within your team, even in such circumstances where sometimes you may feel pressed? Um, and certainly we know we certainly know that there's burnout afoot. Um, but what is it that keeps compassion flourishing within you? So I, I wanted to ask Lisa um, about that first. Okay, sorry, it took me just a second to unmute. Well, um, you know, when I think about compassion, I, I specifically think about this unit that we developed. And this unit is now six years old. And uh, when you were talking about financial impact within, UK, within healthcare, I, I honestly, most of the efforts in the beginning of the development you are working with finance and you're thinking of all of the things that you can do for the organization financially. But when you're the nurses and the doctors, you're thinking something complete opposite. You're thinking this dedicated unit that we're making, this 23 bed unit, this is for people who have no place to go. They have no discharge plan, period. They have no family. They're homeless. Um, it can be a sex offender that no one will accept. 
during COVID. It could be a long-term COVID patient that can't leave the hospital, but doesn't need to be necessarily in the ICU or on acute care. Um, it, it, it can be uh, all ages um, and all, um, all aspects of care. And so we knew early on in order to make this work, we were thinking, okay, how do we decide who works on this particular unit? And what we looked at was, is let's talk to our staff and let's talk to them about what we want to do and what outcomes and what would make us successful on this unit. And we had people that were asking to be placed on this unit, to work on this unit. And that was not just nurses. That was dedicated social workers that wanted to make a difference. It was dedicated hospitalists. When I was listening to Sonia, I was thinking that's exactly what the physicians that I work with do every single day. They are absolutely dedicated to caring for this population because this isn't an area where the patient is there today and gone tomorrow. I was looking at some of our lengths of stay and and last week, uh, we discharged a patient that had been there 772 days. Okay. And, you know, we have shout outs in the hallway when we find a disposition for these patients and we know that we're successful and we look at them when they're at discharge versus when they came on the unit. And that doesn't just happen with one or two people. That takes an entire army to be able to do that. And, and is there burnout sometimes? Absolutely. But the one thing that we do every day is we huddle as a team. We have active listening. And again, this is not just nursing. This is all disciplines. We have active listening. Um, that's not only with um, our staff. That's going in every single room and talking to the patients because we may have a plan for a patient, but the patient may be thinking something totally different. So we have to include them in in that situation with us, this particular unit has greater retention than any unit in our organization. And I think that says a lot um, because I think we're very supportive of each other. Um, and we do that through the sports rounds within our organization, right? We share our patient stories. We share our success stories from this unit. I have one patient there right now. She's been there 669 days and uh, she calls it happy hour every afternoon when she gets to spend time with our rec therapist. She was a high school science teacher and she spends her time being creative and innovative and she shares her stories. And the most recent one this week is uh, she was drawing the solar system and she said, you know, I'm going to hold class here for everyone on the unit. So I just... I just feel it, it just takes a heart. It takes all of our hearts together to care for these people. And when we see a success story in the end, honestly, that's all we need. That's all we need to keep our compassion and keep going. And then we have another patient, because as you know, we have several patients waiting to come to our unit. All the physicians in the organization want their patients to come to our unit because they know that we're successful. They know we're caring and they know that we have really good outcomes with our patients. And so I think that makes a difference, not only for the patients, but for our staff. It's kind of the magic formula. You have each other, you have pride in what you're doing. The patients are successful and, and leave in a uh, well positioned to be able to thrive when they go out or, you know, uh, and have better out health outcomes too, I'm sure. So it's really, um, you know, and the and the love of what you do is is such a rewarding experience. It's really a, a really unique in I think, um, you know, type of a unit. Um, so thanks, Lisa. Um, Kathy, how about you? I know, you know, palliative care, I think some people look at it and think it's so sad. How can you do this? Um, I know you can, um, you can share a little bit of information to the contrary, but why don't you tell us a little bit about how you keep compassion flourishing within yourself and your team? Yeah, I was just listening to Lisa and so much of what she said resonates with me. One is every Schwartz round, it feels like palliative care has been involved in some way. And I think there's something about being invited into spaces where maybe other teams feel less equipped to go into, people who are dying, people who are struggling with bad symptoms, um, people who have no you know, easy path forward, being able to walk 
kind of to the other side of that veil and know that you're going to be able to be present and be able to help. So there's something about that that gives back as much as it takes. And I think the being able to help other healthcare teams move into that space with us and not be afraid that taking away the fear helps to perpetuate the ability to keep doing it. You get so much back by going into those spaces and you, by not being afraid, I think you, it's easier to preserve your, your own humanity. And then the other thing about what Lisa said that really resonates is the team, the ability to go back to the team for, it's like a well of compassion for each other. And I think about, you know, I, I think I was um, offered a definition that compassion is really defined by the person who's receiving it. It can take different shapes um, in different situations. And I think I feel like that when I go back to my team, one day I might need somebody to let me cry on their shoulder. Another day I might need to have them help me work through a problem and come up with a solution to help a patient. Another day I may need to laugh hysterically with them about something funny that happened. And I think having an interprofessional team that can take me in the way I take a patient in and listen to my story and figure out what I need and give me that compassion in whatever form that I need it, we do that for each other in a way that um, in both informal and formal ways um, that we've structured into our team meetings so that we can, we learn from each other. Sometimes we have rituals of remembrance where we remember the patients we've cared for who have died. We've built in these ways of being compassionate and you know, meeting each other's needs in the present moment. That's what I would offer. Yeah. Kathy, you, you said something um, about getting over fear, and I'm just curious if you could say a little bit more about that. A fear of, fear among staff, fear amongst patients. Is it fear of of dying, death and dying? What, what do you, what did you mean? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a mix of things. I think there is a fear of being with someone who may be closer to the end of their life than um, most of us are usually in the presence of and worrying that that might be overwhelmingly sad or scary or, um, you know, I think healthcare teams sometimes worry that they won't know what to do. And so, you know, a really important and joyful part of my work and my team's work is in helping people see that, you know, yes, you will know what to do. Just come, come with me. The patient will tell you what they need, and you will be enough. But um, I think it helps to have somebody holding your hand into that space yeah. and being with you and showing you that if, you know, I always tell the fellows, if you're in the room with a patient and you don't know how to help, you need to listen more. Ask them another question. They will tell you what they need. You just need more information. And eventually, I think people see that that's, that that's true. But having that accompaniment into those spaces, I think, is something that we can we can help with. So compassion to our colleagues who may not be living and breathing this every day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, in so many ways, it's it's so much more about being than about doing. <laughs> being there, being a presence. Your word accompaniment, I love, is just exactly what it's all about. And it's not something we physicians are trained to do. What were you going to say? going to say we teach people so much about what to say yeah. and what we really need to teach them is how to quiet yourself yes. and create the space for the other person. Yeah, how to attune and how to be present, right. Um, 
Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Laura, I'm just curious about what you would say. Again, you know, going into the field of trauma, I think many people would say, goodness, you know, isn't that traumatizing? <laughs> How do you sustain compassion uh, for yourself and your team? Um, you know, I think the most important thing um, in being able to do what I do is um, for me to be healthy. So um, that has um, been a lot about setting boundaries mm -hmm. uh, and creating um, space for me to not be here and heal. Um, when I had mentioned earlier that I got burned out um, at my last job, um, it was because I was working all the time and I was never not um, in this like cortisol stress space. Uh, and so that was a huge change for me um, to, to say, hey, I have to somehow find a way to auto-regulate so I can leave the hospital um, and um, refill my cup and be a healthy, functional human being before I ever try to be a healthy, functional physician. And so um, a lot of my work is centered on that and making sure that there's an infrastructure in place that I don't necessarily have to be here every day. I have uh, an amazing team um, that is empowered and uh, successful. And so they um, pick up the mantle when I'm not here, which is awesome. Uh, and same thing for them. I come in and I kick them out and say, go home and refill your cup. See you in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that... Um, that the practice of compassion um, is really a choice. And um, for me, it's to make sure that um, every time I walk in a room with a patient, um, a staff member, um, cross someone in the hallway, that they get the best version of me, um, which means that my um, busyness goes away, right? If someone wants to talk about something, we stop and we talk about that something and uh, then make adjustments throughout the day um, to make up for that time. Um, if a patient needs 45 minutes to talk about chainsaws in the mountains, cool, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, and uh, so far it has worked out okay. That's wonderful. Um, these are such wonderful comments. I, I, I want to encourage everybody who's listening um, to throw some questions into the Q&A pane. We have a couple here, and I'd like to throw some of them out. I have some questions still of my own, but um, one question said, um, appreciate what Kathy said about formal and informal ways that the interdisciplinary team supports one another. And I'm curious about whether um, others on the panel have built in rituals of compassionate support. I know some of you have mentioned Schwartz rounds, but um, does anybody want to respond to that? Other ways of um, sustaining uh, in an interprofessional, interdisciplinary way, some, some rituals of interprofessional uh, compassion or speaking with one another? I don't know if that's team meetings or I know, uh, you know, you have huddles and things like that, but I'm wondering if those are, any of those are compassion-based um, uh, rituals. So I would, okay, go ahead, Christy. I would say in our, um, in our team meetings and things like that, we're always, and on our, uh, you know, our um, instant messaging that we have within our department, we really uh, celebrate each other and the, you know, the wins of our patients. So on days where we might be struggling or we have patients in really high crisis situations, we can lean on the, you know, the great news that another coworker had with a patient or a patient got housed or, you know, they got access to disability, you know, social security disability, something that um, is a big win for just the team. So we definitely lean on that. That has to sustain us, you know, as uh, said, we can't do this without each other. So each one of us contributes to the whole of helping create those boundaries and celebrating the win. Sure. Um, I was, I was going to also add that a lot of compassion comes out of relationships, right? And establishing relationships uh, this year. Um, our team, the detention doctors, we did a Friendsgiving dinner and uh, we went out and we celebrated and 
preparation for Thanksgiving and just appreciated each other. So that helps to build rapport. And when you're in an environment where you feel supported and connected to your coworkers, there's a lot of uh, collaboration with custody and especially out of COVID just brought custody and health a lot closer together. And so that really kind of helps to drive the compassion because of the relationships and the connections we have with each other. Yeah. Laura, did, were you going to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, we've recently implemented um, one of our processes is a critical incident debrief. Um, and so this is a hospital wide um, process that we've implemented. Um, and within 30 minutes um, of having any crisis situation, which trauma a lot of is, is a lot of that, um, the uh, lead physician for whatever that resuscitation was will sit down with the team um, and just kind of process through um, what worked, what didn't work, um, because I feel like a lot of um, a lot of moral injury comes from not being able to fix problems. You see things go wrong and they don't work, and then no one gives you a solution on how to fix things. Uh, and so we have focused a lot of energy on what needs to be fixed. Like when you went to do that thoracotomy, you went through three fenanchettos because nothing worked. Let's fix that. So um, I think that giving an action to um, the compassion. And then the second half of that um, debrief is that we just talk about our feelings. We had um, a particularly difficult case a few weeks ago. And uh, it's funny because I always find myself asking people, are you guys okay? And I started this debrief and I said, very clearly, none of us are okay. Like we're not okay. And uh, we all just kind of cried. Um, like little young people, old people, uh, boys, girls, we all just sat there and cried together uh, and felt this loss together. Um, and we weren't better when we walked out of the room. But uh, when I saw folks a few days later, they were like, I'm doing a little better. And so, uh, you know, it, it, that's what we're looking for, right? A little better. And just acknowledging that other people are in that space with you, mm. um, experiencing the same pain um, and that you're not alone in that, I think goes a long way. Also, it goes a long way in creating psychological safety if you're able to say, I'm not okay. It has to be okay to say, I'm not okay, you know? Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, anybody else? Interdisciplinary rights rituals for supporting compassion. We do a lot of debriefing on our uh, units, yeah. uh, all of our units, and they're led uh, mainly by the chaplain, and especially if we've had a loss. And the one thing that I've learned through this is uncomfortable silence. I, I used to be very uncomfortable with silence, but now I realize how important silence is because we all think differently. We all speak up differently. And I think we have to allow our, our people time to speak up because I may be ready to talk immediately. But we may be 10 minutes in before someone else has, has something they want to say. So I do think you have to have that uncomfortable silence for everyone because it allows you time to process. Yeah. Oh gosh. So hard to tolerate as a facilitator and so incredibly important, right? Uh, Sumi, were you going to speak? Yes. I was going to say that um, my line of job is very challenging. It's totally different than what all of you guys do because majority of you are in healing and uh, um making it possible for the patient for me is transitioning to end of life mm -hmm. and with that comes a lot of challenges and difficulties so and the driving sometimes the driving and the workload does burn you out completely so gratitude Gratitude and extending a thank you to your colleagues and your teammates means a lot. It's something that's taken for granted a lot. Two simple words, thank you for all you do means a lot. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a renewed confidence to face the challenges and wake up with a renewed um, wanting to continue doing and enhancing the quality of life that you do. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, so much. <laughs> um, I think there might be some more questions popping, um, um, popping up. Um, I think there's a there's a question about promoting compassion in the future. Um, 
you know, the, the work that you all do, your very beings promote compassion. You model it, you breathe it, live it. You encourage it, you promote it, and you provide structures, you know, for it to flourish within your teams. I'm just wondering if, if you sort of think about um, the organization or promoting compassion in general, even beyond your team, what are your thoughts about, is it possible to do that? You know, how do you promote uh, compassion within an organization, for example? Kathy, you're shaking your head. Um, why don't you take that on? I was thinking, um, I've been thinking about this a lot because I've stepped out of palliative care for six months to be the interim chair of medicine at Dartmouth. And so I have a much bigger team and they're not as schooled as the palliative care team in the daily practice of compassionate care. It's just a different world. And so I've really been thinking and I believe trying to model compassionate behavior in everything that I do is probably the most important thing that I can do. So I have so many meetings with people that are feeling aggrieved about something or need, you know, or they have had bad behavior or whatever, and to sort of sit down with them and ask, um, Assume positive intent and ask, tell me, tell me what you need to tell me to, so that I can help you. It's almost the same thing that um, I do with patients, but to give people that time to make their needs known and then to show other people in meetings that that's a way of approaching problems. That you know, listening rather than talking is a way of approaching problems. I don't know, I've heard, I think there's a ripple effect of that when people see a chair of medicine behaving in that way and that I I believe that that will affect our culture. I totally agree with that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Kathy. Um, Sonny, I really want, wondered if you could talk about this because my sense is that you've made a lot of changes, you know, in detention health and um, done a lot to promote compassion. I know you have a particular mantra um, that you live by um, in your work. I wonder if you can unmute and say a little bit about how do you help compassion thrive within the organization, you know, even beyond the team and yourself. Well, I think one thing that's um, really important is to call it out, right? And to share the stories and particularly use those words, compassionate. I mean, I remember watching one of our doctors. This lady, unfortunately, had jumped from the second tier inside one of the modules and she hit a table so she survived the jump. Yeah. And the doctor, you know, we had a cold response and um, the doctor and the lady was actually conscious. So I, you know, and the doctor got down on her knees, called her by her name and talked to her. Mm. And I think I've told that story a million times because here we are. We've got a room full of right. Anytime something happens, you've got a room full of deputies. You've got healthcare staff responding. And yet she got right down next to the patient, mm. and called her name and spoke to her. The lady had some mental health issues and, mm. you know, we got her to the hospital. But just really calling it out and just saying, this is compassionate care, you know, and I think um, that helps to just promote it. And even with the patients, you know, <laughs> one of the things I'd love to do is, you um, because many of our patients haven't had a lot of choice. And when we're offering health care, vaccinations, as you know, many of us uh, work to offer people those things. And when they accept the things that we're offering, I always like to say, that's a really good choice you made. I'm saying that intentionally because I want to promote that you have choice and you made a good choice here. You have compassion and you showed compassion. So I think that's one of the things, just like to tell the stories and to share. Hmm. Um, ah, that's so important. <laughs> I, I love that story. Yeah. And promoting agency, you know, even 
even in a population that is so distant, you know, in such a disempowered situation, you know, um, it's incredible. Um, what do you guys do to, to, you know, take care of yourselves? Uh, setting boundaries, I've heard something about. Christy, do you want to talk about that? Because you, you mentioned about, you know, burnout and so forth. How do you take care of yourself? I take care of myself by spending time with loved ones and colleagues, but uh, yoga is really my mental health, um, yeah. hot yoga in particular. I love to just sweat profusely uh, <laughs> and uh, kind of deal with a, some discomfort um, because the game feels so good afterwards. Um, you know, I, I like to put myself in hard situations. I think back to Dr. Harmon talking about uh, when we met earlier that uh, she decided to major in science because it was the hardest sounding thing. And so, uh, I mean, even though I think all of us, it's important for self-care, I think a lot of our, probably our self-care also involves pushing ourselves into hard things. Um, mm. and, and that challenge uh, actually really helps it becomes self-care too because you're showing your patience you can go the distance we're going to be here with you while you do so you have to give that grace to yourself and even in really tough things so um yeah hot yoga is uh where i would say that i find some real good centering um but Again, self-care also is being with my patients, hearing these stories. I mean, like I said, I started in anthropology. For me, it's all about the story. It's the culture. It's where that person came from. I want them to feel like I want to know it all. Yeah. And, and that I actually gain a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. What about the rest of you? So, I mean, what about you? What do you do for self-care? Um, I love listening to music and I have thousands of playlists depending on my on my mood <laughs> and I love singing in the car when I'm driving from one patient to another as I'm unwinding and like getting it in. Um, I love taking hot baths, um, <laughs> some Epsom salts and all, very hot water. And I would just soak it in there with my glass of wine, uh, especially on a Friday evening. And I would sit in the towel for like a whole half an hour, just unwinding and being thankful and appreciating the whole week and appreciating the small things we take for granted and for any little difference that I made for my patients yeah. and then find balance between work and home and myself. Yeah. Thank you. It sounds very appealing. Actually. <laughs> what about the rest of you? Um, Lisa, what about you? I love hearing this. I'm getting ideas. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I like pet therapy. I have to, I have a dog and my daughter has a dog, which means I have a second dog most of the time. Um, and so I enjoy them because it's very, it's unconditional love. They're so excited to see you when you, when you get home. And I love to take long walks. I think that's very important. It's kind of, my husband walks in the morning and I walk in the evening. He often says, why don't you get up and walk with me? And I said, because that's my time, right? Like I want to be by myself looking around and just thinking. And uh, I, I just think that's so important to have that 45 minutes to an hour just to be alone. Mm -hmm. um, and I like Sumi, I love hot baths. That's an overnight ritual. And if we are away from home and the hotel does not have a tub, we are changing rooms <laughs> because I, I just need that in order yeah. to relax and uh um, I appreciate good sleep. I think it's so important because I want to come home at night and get good rest because the next day I want to go back and give 110%. And I can only do that if I have a good night's sleep. Hmm, what great advice. Well, I would ask all of you, but I think unfortunately we're going to have to bring the webinar to a close. Um, it's just been such a delight and so inspiring and uplifting, and it's made me very happy to speak with all of you. I hope it has to others who are listening. I'm going to turn this back over to Julie. 
Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you who joined here today for this really inspiring uh, conversation. We hope that you enjoyed this Compassion in Action webinar. Please keep an eye out on your email for news of future events. And finally, please take a moment to fill out the very brief survey we'll be sending you after the webinar. We appreciate your feedback on today's session. Thank you for joining us and for your commitment to compassionate health care. Take care, and we hope to see you soon. Bye, everybody.